ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Hello, and welcome to On Air Actually Rocket Science, the official podcast of the Aerospace and Geodesy Student Council at the Technical University of Munich. Hosting today is me, Killian, and Philippe. Hey. And we are happy today to uh, have uh, Professor Klaus Rexler joining us, the head of the chair for um, carbon composites at the Technical University of Munich, as well as uh, one of the directors of the Fraunhofer IGCV um, in charge for composite materials. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, so before we get into uh, uh, the main substance, we, we want to ask you a few this or that questions where we give you two, uh, two options to choose from uh, and see which one you prefer. So I think this one's pretty obvious to start with, but uh, mm -hmm. glass or carbon fibers? <laughs> carbon fiber. <laughs> uh, second one would be thermosets or thermoplasts? Oh, it depends. <laughs> thermosets. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Prepreg or a wet layup? Ooh. <laughs> Prepreg for aerospace, wet layup for all the rest. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, next one is Augsburg or München. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot handle this story. <laughs> oh, I'm in Munich now. Let's say Autobrunn. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, and then finally, uh, mountains or, or, or the seaside? Uh, mountains. mountains. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a good insight into it. Um, so, yeah, so you uh, you studied aerospace engineering at the University of Stuttgart. Yeah. Uh, and that's also where you did your PhD. Mm -hmm. And I, as I previously said, you lead uh, the Fraunhofer Institute um, and also the, the LCC. Um, but I was just wondering before we get into you know carbon fiber itself and what we have in front of us, mm -hmm. what, what's your personal motivation into uh, getting into carbon fiber when, when you were studying, perhaps? Uh, it's a very exciting material and uh, I had the chance to work in my PhD on textile structural composites. That means that we uh, looked for textile technologies for composite materials because we have to work with, with fibers, carbon fibers, glass fibers. We have to bring them automatically near net shaped in an architecture and of a configuration where the fibers can utilize their good properties. And so uh, composite materials are really a broad material where you have can work with textile technologies, you can work with material science, with design, structure mechanics. So it implies, uh, implies so many technologies and basic science, and that's exciting. Yeah. And also the performance of the material. If you see a crashing structure of a composite material, it's so different from, from metal and the potential for optimizing it is so great. And I think that's exciting in composite materials. That's true, yeah. And, and do, do you remember the, perhaps the, the first part that you yourself made out of uh, carbon fiber? Oh, good question. Uh, so I worked as a student at the DLR in Stuttgart, and there we worked on, on rockets. So it was really part of a, of a small rocket, of course. Mm -hmm. It was a fin. So I think that was the first part we worked on as a student. It's it's, it's funny that because uh, Var Rocketry is currently working on uh, on fins himself uh, in, okay. in your very lab. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so you also spent a, a good part of your career at uh, Daimler Chrysler, um, where you were the the wissenschaftliche Leiter für Prüf- und Verfahrungstechnik of FVK. Yeah. Uh -huh. what, what exactly does that does that entail, and and what? What were your responsibilities? Yeah. So after my PhD in Stuttgart, it was always my plan to go to Munich. Yeah. And I had the opportunity to start here 500 meters from here at Messerschmitt Bölko Blom, the central laboratories. And there my first position was uh, in the central department for polymers to work on composite material for for planes. At that time, uh, it was the beginning of, of Airbus. Uh, tornado was a big topic for us, so developing thermoplastic structures, for example, for uh, these planes. And uh, yeah, later on, it was the time of this integrated uh, industry uh, consortium where MBB, Dornier, uh, Mercedes uh, were brought together. And it was a very, very exciting time here in Ottobrunn because we worked on buses, Formula One, on planes, on trains, and all composite materials. And that was really a very interesting time. I learned a lot about the difference of all these industry sectors and their meanings. It's high volume, it's high performance, it's functionality. And that was my 
my part. So working together with the Donje people in Friedrichshafen, with Mercedes in Stuttgart, with Atrans, the train people in Berlin. And so it, yeah, it was a great time. And also time the crisis in Detroit, uh, learning the yeah how United States, US people are developing cars and how they do research and development. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You're, you're, you're additionally also a curator for the German Museum, the Deutsches Museum here in Munich. Um, what is your role? What position do you play? Like, it's, it's, do you have any educational representation there? Or yeah, uh, I had a great chance uh, to establish a special show there. It was called uh, Harter Stoff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm the president of Composite United. So Composite United is uh, the society where all, nearly all compo uh, companies and institutes uh, are working together, networking, teaming up. And uh, part of this Composite United was a so-called leading edge cluster, Spitzencluster on composite materials where we got 80 million euros for working on the future of composite materials, 40 million funding, 40 million from industry. And it was not only on technology development, but also on uh, publicity of our material. And so we had the chance to establish this special show in the Deutsche Museum, Harter Stoff, and that was part of my work. And afterwards, yeah, I got the chance to work as a curator in Deutsche Museum. Yeah, and we are sitting together once a year and probably also in smaller teams during the year and you discuss the future of the Deutsche Museum, what are the recent technologies, how should we present our work at the Deutsche Museum and yeah, that's very interesting and exciting. So let's get into the substance that we're here for now. If you were to explain what carbon fiber reinforced plastics are to someone who, who is not familiar with the, with the, with the subject. What, how would you explain it to them? Yeah. So we are kind of combining fibers and the metrics. So mostly a, a resin and the fibers, mainly carbon fibers, but all other fibers, glass fibers, natural fibers, like flex, flex fibers, they have a very high performance, good stiffness, good strength. But it's important to integrate these fibers according to the external loads. So these materials only have a good performance if we arrange the fibers according to the loads. And that means that we have a lot of possibilities to uh, tune the material, to optimize the material according to the loads and to the functionality. And this combination of the load carrying fibers and the funct functional metrics, so the resin for example, shaping the fibers, bringing the fibers in the form, brings the good performance of the material. And so for good performance we need material science, we need process technology, structure mechanics, and automation technologies and so that's I think the exciting thing in composite materials that we can integrate so many science fields. 100%. I think it's very intuitive for people to understand you know how you get the resin how you get the things but how do you get the fibers themselves I mean just a chain of carbon like how how would you even start beginning the process how do you even get that? Mm -hmm. So uh, for the carbon fibers the basis at the moment is oil. So it's an oil-based material. From the oil, we produce a so-called precursor. That's a, a textile fiber with a high amount of carbon in it and a good alignment of the carbon uh, molecules. And in a high temperature process, we are forming and producing the carbon fibers. And so the good thing of carbon fibers is the very high stiffness and the good strength because of a good alignment of the molecules and the good bonding of the molecules of the carbon molecules in the material. And therefore these carbon fibers show this good performance compared to other fibers. But the fiber itself doesn't help. So we have to integrate it in the matrix. And the matrix is, for example, uh, responsible for the media resistance, temperature resistance, uh, but also for the damage tolerance, for example, the crush performance. That's very interesting. And what I also find very interesting, especially about your career and uh, in, in the era that's evolving in, is that the, the, the science of carbon fiber reinforced plastics is relatively new comparing to engineering from yeah. the 1950s mm -hmm. uh, onward but it's only really developed and, and really got, got going perhaps in the 1990s, in the turn of the century. For you having spent your, your career, obviously not at the beginning of it, but mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the 
evolution of mm, the science. Mm. How how was that for you to continuously uh, see the, the the science improving? Yeah, uh, it's really exciting that you always see new developments. Uh, so we are a relatively small family. So for example, this composite United covering uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So we have around 400 members. Uh, It's a lot on the one hand side, but on the other hand side, it's, it's a small family. So we know each other on the one hand, but on the other hand, there are always new, uh, new application, new ideas. Uh, and uh, we have also some type of waves. So we have times where the aerospace is dominating and their lightweight is very important. Then we had the time BMW, for example, worked on the i3. It's a more or less complete carbon car. And that was an exciting time to work on high volume because high volume and costs was very important. And that's interesting in our technology. When I started working on composite material, it was all about performance. Lightweight potential, good stiffness, good strength, good damage tolerance. And then it was about high volume, the time of aerospace, uh, of automotive industry, excuse me. And then it was about costs to optimize. And now it's all about sustainability. And I, for sure a topic we will cover because sustainability means that we apply carbon composites in applications like wind energy or hydrogen storage. But it's also about optimizing the technology, the manufacturing technologies, for example, on bio-based material and uh, yeah, energy optimized processes. Yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting. So I think uh, let's jump into straight into one of the applications um, that is big at, at the chair that uh, that you lead, and that's hydrogen tanks, um, hydrogen pressure vessels, to be to be more precise. Why why is the topic of hydrogen pressure vessels interesting uh, for for a chair of carbon composites? Mm -hmm. uh, on one hand, it's a perfect structure for carbon composites because the, the loads are very well defined and we can optimize uh, the structure for composite materials. And uh, following on this design, we can produce the material really very, very good. And we have several uh, manufacturing technologies and therefore the weight saving potential is very high. We can really save compared to steel 60% of weight. And I think that's very, very essential for cars, but also for trucks. We are working on very big uh, pressure vessels at the moment for the trucks. And uh, so their weight, weight saving potential is very important because we can save 100 kilograms of weight compared to steel. And what we learned during working together with also quite new partners for us uh, is that there's still a lot of potential to optimize. So you can say pressure vessels, it's an quite old structure, you can filament, filament wind, uh, where is the potential for research and technology, but we found a lot of topics. And so you, you already went to um, the applications for, for such tanks, but does it, does it go further than that in the future? Are, are the hopes of perhaps, um, you know, making it widespread or so what, what's the hope for, for hydrogen tanks uh, 10 years, 20 years down, down the line? Mm -hmm. uh, high volume, of, of course, and high volume for automotive industry means low cost. So we have to optimize the process to really guarantee an affordability of the structures. And therefore we need a good material basis, low cost carbon fibers, hopefully bio-based carbon fibers in the future, but also automated processes with low waste and um, low um, labor costs. That's very important because we want to produce these structures in Germany. And that's a big topic for us uh, because a lot of these high volume structures, the applications are now uh, being produced in China, for example. If you look on bicycle rims or bicycle frames, I think 95, 99% are produced in China. Of course, a big issue for logistics we learned during the last years. And though that's a good example, if we uh, manage to produce these structures affordable in Germany. And for example, a company like Munich Composites, one of our spin-offs is working on these topics by braiding technologies, again, textile structural composites, the basis of my work. And so we have the chance really to bring uh, value to, to Germany and to, uh, or to Europe and to produce the structures in the future in Germany. But that means automation, automated technologies. And so, so uh, another 
uh, part of the hydrogen research that goes on at, at your chair is not only the uh, cylind cylindrical ones mm -hmm. and, or the classical, uh, mm -hmm. what you think of a hydrogen tank, but you also uh, have two projects that are working on uh, mm -hmm. what I, I guess are described as cuboidal uh, <laughs> tanks, yeah, uh, which yeah. I guess you could imagine to be a rather rectangular, flatter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What's 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 a, the progress like on, on such a, yeah, such yeah, a, such a yeah. project? Uh, it sounds crazy because uh, storage means normally a cylinder. Yeah. So a component like you see here, that's from the structural mechanics viewpoint perfect. We can produce it easily by filament winding, for example. But from the application side as well in automotive and in aerospace, it's very often important due to packaging reasons to have a special housing and that's not tubular for example and therefore we had the idea at the beginning together with BMW because their idea was to uh, design a car which can be the same design can be used for batteries but also for hydrogen storage and therefore we have a rectangular shape and the idea was or the task for us was to develop hydrogen storage design and manufacturing technology for this special shape. And after that, when we published it and had our first ideas and success and first patterns, all the aerospace industry asked us, can we do the same for aerospace, for example, to integrate the storage in, uh, in a wing, for example. And uh, the idea is, of course, in a special volume to integrate as much hydrogen as possible. And therefore, this rectangular design is very interesting. But from a structural mechanical viewpoint, it's a nightmare. But we had some ideas for designing and for manufacturing these structures. And so at, at the chair, you currently have two projects uh, working on this um, using two different processes. Uh, one is uh, winding and the other one is uh, automatic fiber placement. Do you just want to briefly uh, explain the, the differences between those two processes and how it relates to, mm -hmm. to, the, yeah. to the project? So, Filament winding is state of the art. So we have a, a resin bath and we are putting the, the carbon fibers through the resin bath. Then it's like a filament, like a winding machine. We have a core. This core normally is an, uh, also imp uh, important for the permeability. So it's a metal structure or special polymer structure. And then we place the fibers on this structure and then we cure the resin and then the structure is more or less finished. So very interesting, very simple, affordable uh, process, but limited, for example, in the resin we can use and also limited in the fiber architecture we can realize, especially in these dome areas. Fiber placement, advanced fiber placement means that we are using an industrial robot and we are placing the fibers and the fibers can be impregnated with a matrix, a thermoset or a thermoplastic resin. And then we are much more flexible in the placement geometry and how we uh, place the fibers on this liner on the core. As you mentioned, the application of the hydrogen tanks and the wings of the aircraft. And honestly, nowadays we use more and more carbon composites in airplanes because obviously lightweight applications are very important. Do you maybe have some historical information maybe do you know which was the first port that was implemented in an aircraft actually and what it meant for the aircraft industry to now be able to use carbon fibers and how do you see the future mm -hmm. so uh, it was very interesting how airbus worked with composite materials because in the 80s they started with the fin structure of the A300. It was the first primary structure, so really load carrying structure in uh, civil aircraft. And from this component or with this component, they learned how to produce the component, how to, uh, to service the component, repair, for example, maintenance. They worked together with the airlines, of course, uh, and got a lot of experience. And then from this first structure, more and more structures have been integrated in planes, the horizontal, um, stabilizer, then the first um, component for the pressurized fuselage for the, about the A3, 340, 600 with the pressure bulkhead in carbon composites. And the big step, of course, was then the Dreamliner, Boeing and uh, the Airbus A340. And uh, this 
challenge, I think, uh, or this competition was also very exciting between uh, Airbus and Boeing. And I think it's always good to have competition and have the challenges. And so this uh, led to the fact that we have now really complete composite planes from Airbus and from uh, Boeing for, for long range. And now, of course, it's a competition again between materials for the next generation of the A320 follower. Uh, and there, of course, it's a competition between aluminium. Aluminium is also developing with new alloys, with new joining technologies. And uh, it might be that we will have a good um, combination of materials, for example, with the wing being produced with aluminium and uh, the fuselage, sorry, and the wing with using carbon composite because in these two components for short range plane, I think we can utilize these materials optimized. It's different for the air taxis. That's of course for us also a very interesting topics. Lilium and uh, Volocopter only as two examples. There are hundreds of projects worldwide working uh, on this vertical mobility as part of the future mobility. And there all components consist of composite materials. We have of course the structure, but we have all the propellers and propellers again means uh, very, very high volume and very high performance. And the exciting thing in this air tax is, is that we now can combine our know-how from aerospace technology, so the performance and high volume automated technologies from automotive industry, because the performance has to be aerospace, also the qualification, the lightweight design, but uh, Lilium and others, um, they plan 5,000 vehicles a year. And that's not high volume automotive technology, but it's much, much more than aerospace technology is used. So due to technical reasons, uh, we have to take a short break, but we will be right back after the short word from Marius and University Politics. How does a faculty search campaign work? A faculty search campaign is a process that has the goal of finding a new professor for the university. It starts when the department identifies a topic that should be researched more and fits well into the local research environment, or when an external entity offers to fund a specific professorship. A call for applications is written up by professors of related fields and discussed with the Dean's and President's Office. If this text is approved, it will go to the School Council and Senate for official confirmations. This process alone can already take several years. When all confirmation has been achieved, this call will be published and the university awaits applications. For some topics, even external headhunting companies will be asked to identify suitable candidates and ask those to apply. In the meanwhile, the school council will choose the members of the faculty search committee, which also includes up to two students, one of which is eligible to vote in the committee. So um, we were talking about, you know, the applications of carbon fiber in aerospace. And I think one of the biggest topics in aerospace itself is certification, um, because obviously we want the thing to fly and reliably. And so you don't do not only have to certificate the material itself, but also the process behind it. Like what the, what goes into it? What do you have to watch out for? And what's the main importance mm -hmm. when doing mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, and that's the challenging point, because in composite materials, the structure um, is produced with the performance during the process. It's not like a metal structure where you can separate the material production with a sheet metal, for example. And then in the second step, you do the post forming and uh, the assembly and uh, welding, for example. But in our process, everything comes together. And for a good component, you need, again, the material, material science, qualification of the material, and then uh, carbon fibers come together with the resin. The next topic, you have to qualify, and then you have to qualify also the, the testing methods, non-destructive non testing, for example, to see if there are any um, failures in the material. Uh, you have to understand the meaning of a misalignment of a fiber, for example, that leads to a so-called knockdown factor. So the performance is a little lower compared to what you expected, but you cannot have or guarantee 100%. Then you have, would have a lot of waste and you will also have a non-affordable process. And so you have to, uh, to understand the meaning of misalignment, for example, or in the components, you always have vo voids. You cannot avoid voids, but you have to understand 
ist 1% okay oder ist 5% okay? Uh, what about the distribution of the voids and the size of the voids? And there are so many topics you have to understand and to bring all this understanding in the qualification process, in the documentation. And therefore, no wonder, aerospace uh, is not the most uh, you know, aggressive uh, applicator and uh, developer because the certification, qualification means a lot of money and therefore you really have to, to think about next steps. So it's the material or the next generation of a material or the next crazy idea of a university really worth to go into the qualification of a new process, for example. On, on, on the topic of, of, of aerospace, I think uh, something a lot of people perhaps think about is um, if, if I have a bump in a aluminum fuselage, um, I can see it from the outside and I see the damage, mm -hmm. but that's not necessarily the case with uh, carbon fiber. So yeah, uh -huh. it, um, when you have damage in carbon fiber, it's very much possible that it's not noticeable from the outside. Mm -hmm. Does that have certain implications for... Um, the way that we implement c carbon fiber in, in, in fuselages? Yes, of course, yeah. Uh, again, it's a meaning of understanding. You have to understand during design what's happening uh, due to an impact, for example. And the, the performance indicator we are talking about is damage tolerance. That means how damage tolerant, how tolerant is a material or component uh, after an impact, for example. And what we see, you mentioned it, in metal structures, you get a, a dent, you see it. And then you can decide, I have to repair or I can continue to fly. In composite materials, the components are very stiff. And so normally we do not see a dent, but you mentioned it, we can have a damage inside. We call it delamination because in uh, the process we are using in aerospace, we are using laminates. So sheet by sheet, tens of a millimeter, one layer after the other of, comp of composite materials are brought together in a placement process, for example, uh, and this builds the component. And the good performance of the carbon fibers can only be utilized um, in plain area, but not in thickness area. And nowadays we have very tough resins with a good damage tolerance, but anyway, it can happen that we have inside the structure these so-called delaminations, where we have a debonding of these layers. It can be very small, but it can grow during fatigue, during uh, dynamic loading. And we have, have to understand during design, what is the meaning of these delaminations to the performance, but we have also to understand how we can find this component during maintenance. And there the airlines come into play. And we have non-destructing technologies, non-destructing te technologies. We also have a chair here at the Technical University of Munich working on the, these technologies. And so we can deal with, but we have to deal with and during design, but also during maintenance. And of course, we have also need the repair methods because we have, we have a small damage, uh, small delamination. We cannot throw the, the plane <laughs> away, but we have these repair methods. So that was actually going to be my, my next question of, um, you have different, uh, obviously, categories. If, if it's a, a very small um, uh, impact, it might be to the scale where it can be ignored and, and, yeah. and it's mm -hmm. uh, totally fine to fly with. But what about you know bigger impacts where uh, perhaps you have ground vehicles that run into a fuselage, mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. and there's an actual damage that's uh, non-flyable? How, how, how would you go ahead uh, fixing something like that? Yeah, uh, so there are two, two possibilities. One is to, to replace um, a component. So if it's uh, we have repair areas, we can really replace the component and uh, glue a new component in. That's one possibility, that's for big damages. And for smaller damages, we can repair locally. So we remove the damaged area and then we placed a new patch, for example, repair patch on, and this structure afterwards has really the same performance than before. But how, how exactly is that? Because w when the strength of, of, a, of a carbon fiber part mm -hmm. is due to the fact that you have these long strands that yeah, uh, are mm -hmm. uh, mostly uninterrupted. And when you place a pl patch over, over let's say, a, an, an injured part, mm -hmm. does it have 
let's say, 100% of the strength they had before, or is it tolerable to the f- amount that you can fly? Yeah, no, it has 100%. Uh, or it can have 100%. Okay. So if you use the right repair methods, mm-hmm. and also there you need an understanding of the structure mechanics. You cannot only cut this this piece and uh, patch a new on, but you need a, a, sp- a big area mm-hmm. where you integrate the structure really to yeah, have this good performance of the component like That's before. Nice. Um, and so, before we move on uh, out of aerospace, uh, another application where we where we can see um, uh, CFRP is uh, aeronautical propulsion. So engines and um, the GE ninety already has a uh, fan blades that are mm-hmm. mostly yeah. made out of carbon fiber. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Do you see any um, applications of, of of the material inside um, a, a gas turbine uh, or rather a jet engine? I would like to see, but uh, the problem is uh, the temperatures. So we and my chair, we are working with polymer composites and there the temperature range is up to 200 degrees centigrade. So we can only uh, go for the so-called cold part in the engine. There are more applications than the fan blades, the air intakes, for example, or covering structures. And we are working together with MTU, for example, on new applications for FCAS, for example. Their lightweight design will be very important, but it's always for this so-called cold structure. For the hot structure, we need ceramic matrix composites. So I all um, only mentioned uh, up to now thermoplastics and thermosets, but we can also use metals or ceramics as a matrix. So we can produce ceramic matrix composite with high temperature fibers, but also high temperature matrix, and that's also carbon, for example. Uh, it's a very, very specialized technology, and there are only a few institutes in Germany working on this. Uh, and so I think the application potential up to now is limited by the future, but for the future, very interesting because also having lightweight design in these hot structures is of interest. But so, so the, the, the cold structures you, 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 you're referring to, um, uh, perhaps a compressor of, 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 mm-hmm. of the jet. Um, What's what's the timeline that that you see a, a carbon fiber reinforced the polymers and in the compre- compressors of of uh, mainstream jets? Yeah, so I, I think in FCAS in the the engine we will see these components. Right. So five to ten years. And and in this in the civil a- um, area. Uh huh. Mm, I can be the same. I think it's yeah. really the the question uh, if the the engine developers want to go for it. If, if it's worth it's possible, the, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the we are prepared. Okay. <laughs> we actually would like to move to another topic, and I think it's a really big topic in in, in CFRP, and that would be recycling. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we can really start with a lot of things. We, there's, for example, the EU that forbid in 2004, you know, the landfill disposal of carbon fibers. So mm-hmm. there is different pillars to um, recycling. So mm-hmm. one would be preventing waste, mm-hmm. one would be recycling the fibers themselves and the processes behind recycling those mm-hmm. fibers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would first of all like to to hear how would you go about preventing waste, especially in research, I think a lot of waste is generated and mm-hmm. how can you use that waste or how can you prevent waste? That would be something I'd be very interested mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, the first and most important answer, we can recycle carbon composites, because sometimes people say, oh, not imp- not possible to recycle composite materials. We can do. But of course, there are several technologies and several challenges. Like you mentioned, uh, to reduce waste is the first step. And by special technologies, for example, the filament winding or some of these textile technologies, we can really re- reduce the waste to less than 10 percent. That's not the case in state-of-the-art processes. So very often, if you look on, on YouTube videos, how uh, cars are produced, composite materials, we can have 40% of waste. That's not thrown away, but it's used again, but for low-performance applications. And the goal for us, of course, or our challenge uh, is not a downcycling, but a recycling that we use our high performance carbon fiber, then the carbon fibers are not cheap. We have to apply these carbon fibers in a second cycle with the same performance and also for high performance components. And that's our challenge and our goal. And there are several technologies. 
So at the beginning, the first step, we have to separate the carbon fibers and the, the resin. And there are te technologies like pultrusion or solvolysis, so chemical processes where we burn the resin or, we, uh, the, uh, or resolve the resin. And then we have the carbon fibers. But the carbon fibers then in a yeah, special configuration. And the question is, how can we apply this rest of the carbon fibers to high performance products? And there we have several technologies. For example, we can spin fibers again of the, the rest of this uh, recycled material, or we can use paper technologies, wet layup, for example, to produce non-wovens. And we have a quite nice machine in my Fraunhofer Institute in Augsburg, so real industrial scale machine, where we can um, produce very high volume, very affordable non-wovens based on, textile, on uh, recycled carbon fibers with a good homogeneity, also with an align, alignment of the fibers. And really the goal is to apply uh, the good material performance also in the recycled carbon fibers we have a good performance but we have to align these fibers and to produce semi-finished products in high volume affordable with an alignment of these fibers so for example if you would um, extract the fibers for example paralysis would you really get 100 percent of the um, strength of the fiber back or mm -hmm. is there some because of the process that there is I don't know some char still on the fibers or something that it would reduce the effectivity because I mean in some sense we can approximate the 100% mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. we can never reach it or can yeah, yeah yeah it's not 100% but it can be close to 100% with a proper process so we have to understand uh, all of factors of influence of this uh, pyrolysis process so the temperature the pressure how um, what type of gases are we are using, but it's not 100%. And on the original fibers, we also have a so-called sizing, and this sizing guarantees a good bonding between the fiber and the resin. And we have also to resize the, uh, the carbon fibers. That's also a process we need to guarantee this good bonding again for the damage tolerance, for example. Is, is there a way, so are these recycling processes, because the first step is obviously recycling the thing so we can use it properly, mm -hmm. but then afterwards we have to make the process itself, you know, um, sustainable and according to some mm -hmm. uh, laws and everything, because I, I was doing some residual stress testing on aircraft frames out of aluminum and they were saying that usually they wanted to make them out of carbon fiber mm -hmm. but then they decided well you know there was some recyclability and sustainability issues mm -hmm. and so they made them out of aluminium instead and so i think that's maybe how can we make this process green or sustainable in some sense in order to make it viable for the future mm -hmm. yeah so we have to work on again all technologies uh, for example a very exciting topic we are working on at the moment are bio-based carbon fibers and bio-based resins. I mentioned before, so far oil is used for this precursor as a state-of-the-art material, but we can all use mainly all basic materials having a lot of carbon in. And lignin or cellulosis are by basis, or algae, we have here our algae technicum. Uh, Professor Brück is operating from Technical University of Munich. It can be a basis, uh, but there are also other basic materials, bio-based material, we can apply to produce carbon fibers and also resins. It's also possible, but the performance is not high enough at the moment. And that's our challenge and we are working on it. That's uh, our basic research in Munich, as well as in Stuttgart, Aachen and Dresden. There are several research hotspots in Germany working on it. Uh, it's working in lab scale, but now we have to scale it up to industrial state. And then for sure we will have this bio-based material. That's the first step. And then the next step is the process technology. We already discussed low waste, affordable, automated, but mainly waste is the topic for good sustainability, but also to reduce temperatures. You asked me at the beginning, thermosets or thermoplastics. So for thermosets, we can 
uh, use low temperatures. It can be room temperature and filament winding, for example, and that's very energy efficient. For thermoplastics, we have to melt the thermoplastic during the process, and we have some thermoplastics for aerospace, for example, that's polyether ether ketone, the only material offering the uh, temperature stability, stability we need in the application, but it means during the process that we need close to 400 degrees centigrade to melt it. So we can do it with a laser, that's more or less efficient, but I think it's obvious that room temperature curing compared to 400 degrees means a big difference in energy efficiency. And all these topics we have to, uh, to optimize and we have to understand. So on, on the topic of energy efficiency, um, it's widely known that producing a kilogram of uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforced plastics or even just the carbon fibers themselves compared to a kilogram mm -hmm. of steel is much more energy intensive. Mm -hmm. what, what, why exactly? What, where does that energy go? What, why do you need all that energy for, mm -hmm. for the requirements? So in this process, uh, bringing the, this precursor, so the, the textile fibers to the carbon fibers, need temperatures of 1600 to 2000 degrees centigrade. We need it for this carbonization process to get rid of the, the molecules we do not want to have in the carbon fiber to, for the good alignment. So it's a very, very complex chemical process. Not a lot of people really understand, uh, but it's a high temperature process. There are possibilities to make this more efficient by using, for example, microwave curing compared to, to an oven. That's one possibility to reduce it. But it's also mainly on using bio-based materials where we can also reduce the, the temperature uh, during the process, but mainly to get rid of the oil. And so you already touched on, on my next topic was mm -hmm. the, uh, natural fibers, mm -hmm. um, wood, cotton, uh, other such uh, mm -hmm. materials that, that you, you mentioned before. Do, do we see their uses also in a aerospace in, um, application, or are we just talking more uh, less uh, load intensive uh, applications? Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, it's a natural material. And we talked about qualification. Qualification means uh, a stable performance of the basic material, and that cannot gu be guaranteed by these uh, natural fibers. They are very interesting regarding the performance. They are very light and the performance is really good. But from a sustainability viewpoint, if you make the overall balance, they are not so good like you could imagine because you need a lot of water for the for growing. You need for the next process, you need drying processes. Drying is always not so sustainable. And so from a sustainability viewpoint, they are not so good you could imagine. We may talk about growing natural fibers, but it's an interesting material, but really not for aerospace due to uh, this non-conformal -con performance of the material. It's a natural material. But for example, in automotive industry, uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities to use it and all carbon, all car manufacturers are working on the application of natural fibers in their products as for the interior, for example. Um, so then next, uh, I, I think we'd, we'd move on to uh, the, the topic of processing. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the topic of autoclaves is very interesting because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seems like the industry is trying to move away from, from auto, autoclaves. Mm -hmm. First of all, could you explain what an autoclave is and, and, and why it's no longer uh, mm -hmm. wanting to be mm -hmm. the, the, the way to go? Yeah, so during the process uh, of, of producing carbon fiber components, we need temperature and pressure. We have to cure the resin. Uh, I mentioned the room temperature curing material for filament winding, for example, but that doesn't offer the temperature resistance we need for aerospace applications. And therefore we need high temperature during curing. Can be 120 or 160 degrees. And so the autoclave is more or less an oven. But we need also pressure to compress these layers. I mentioned that we are placing layer by layer to uh, produce the thickness of a special component, but then we have to consolidate it, to compress it. And so during this process, we need a, a good combination of temperature and pressure. And this can be guaranteed and controlled in an autoclave. So an autoclave is a pressurized oven. 
where we can control the heat up and the cooling down phase and we can also control the pressure inside the oven. So it's a very interesting process. We are using a so-called pre-preg, pre-impregnated carbon fiber tapes where we can very, very good control the alignment of the fiber, the resin content compared to the uh, content of the carbon fibers in the pressure and with a good combination of this temperature and pressure, we can guarantee that we have very, very low void contacts and only small voids. So it's really the process for high performance components. But you can imagine, I talked about temperature, I talked about uh, pressure. It's not very affordable. Yeah. It's not sustainable. We need a lot of energy and all the, the investment is quite high of an autoclave. Um, it's not so easy to operate the autoclave uh, sustainable because they are quite big and it's a matter of how to fill the components in the, uh, in the autoclave. So it's a matter of logistics where we can use artificial intelligence, for example, to uh, really um, optimize this process really for good filling of the autoclave that helps a little bit. But anyway, it's an big investment and it's uh, expensive to operate. And though we are working, for example, on the material side and so-called non-autoclave prepregs, where we don't need these high temperatures and the high pressure, that's a development of the material side, but we are working also on so-called online consolidation filament placement processes. And there again, thermoplastic materials are very interesting because by using these industrial robots for the placement and using a laser to heat up the thermoplastic materials in the layer point to meld it very efficiently only in this area, we can again with high pressure guaranteed by the robot, we can place the carbon fibers on the mold layer by layer and it's then final, a final component. It's consolidated on the fly and we do not need an autoclave for a next step. So that's also one of the technologies of the future. So the, the topic of uh, automation is also very interesting mm -hmm. uh, because uh, as you're mentioning, uh, automatic f fiber placement, automatic tape layering, um, both automated uh, processes, but are there some applications where there's always going to have to be a person, an employee manually um, uh, laying up a, a, a part or do you feel like we can really go into an automated uh, carbon mm -hmm. fiber world? Yeah, um, it's a matter of, of investment. So of course in, uh, in the aerospace industry, the, the volume is quite low. And so we really have to, to calculate, uh, does it really make sense to invest in an automated line? Because this investment can be in a lot, millions of millions of euros. And so you can decide as a company, do you stay with um, hand layup, for example, with qualified people, it's possible they have a good quality. And so the investment is quite low. And that's also one of the exciting things in composite materials that we, without a lot of investment, we can really produce nice high performance parts. And if you run through our laboratory, you see a lot of uh, surfboards, pedals, uh, bicycle parts, bicycle components, all produced by students, by students groups, Aka Fleek, uh, Too Fast, but also in our practicas, for example. And uh, with very, very low investment, you can produce parts. So, of course, I'm always talking about auto automation and it's important to automate for our automate, uh, automotive industry and also for good quality for uh, aerospace parts and also big components. You can only uh, produce by, by robots, for example. But there's also, I think, a good field, good applications for hand layup. But that would that would rather like concern smaller things and consumer goods. Mm -hmm. But um, there was once a quote from you which stated that you would be able to reduce the cost by ninety percent for the um, production of CFRP parts. And th that sounds like a very big promise to some degree. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'd be very curious. How would that be? Would we just optimizing the process or making the process cheaper or does technology grow and then everything becomes cheaper? Or how would you even do that? Mm. Again, we have to cover all, all fields. Uh, it's not easy to, to answer your question. But um, 
when we started this leading edge cluster, for example, with a lot of research where aerospace industry worked together with automotive industry and, and the institutes, uh, we had a level where typically one kilogram of carbon fiber component costs 100 euros. Very, very roughly with the demonstrator component we had in mind. After our research work, five years later, we had already demonstrated 20 euros per kilogram for the same component. Again, very roughly, it depends on the size of the component, the performance you need and, and the volume. But it was really a big step forward due to automation, due to optimized processes. Tooling is very important, uh, low cost tooling and uh, also the heating of the tooling. Um, so that's a big step forward. We will see for sure uh, again, future reductions in costs by optimized materials. But for example, if you look to, for the carbon fibers, at the moment there's a shortage on market because there are so many new applications for wind energy blades. For example, you need tons of carbon fibers because the, all the blades are produced using composite materials. So the, aer the aerodynamic shape, we are using uh, glass fibers and the sandwich material. But for the load carrying parts for the big uh, wings, we are using so-called spar caps. That's uh, unidirectional tapes in the uh, future, uh, in, in the blade, where only carbon fibers can guarantee the stiffness we need. And you can imagine for these big blades for offshore uh, wind energy uh, facilities, we need tons and tons of carbon fibers, good for the industry, uh, but bad for the competition and for the cost situation. We see a lot of new uh, carbon fiber plants in, in China, for example, but we don't know the, really the performance and if they go for the global market because they need a lot of carbon fibers internally and so at the moment there's a, a shortage of carbon fibers and of course that's not good to reduce prices but that's economy i think that uh, like uh, yeah, economy is working and our part can be in research is, is again to reduce waste of these extensive carbon fibers uh, really to use each gram in the component and really to utilize the performance of the carbon fibers due to a good design. And so we have possibilities, but it's also a matter of, of competition. So I guess just to wrap up, um, I'm, I'm wondering what you think the next big revolution is uh, in the field of material science. So carbon fiber uh, is, is probably currently the, the gold standard, but do you think it's just going to be rather an evolution of carbon fiber or will there be some revolution, revolutionary new, new material that uh, mm. takes us out of place? Okay, oh, that's a very good question. Uh, honestly, I see at the moment more evolution yeah. in all, all topics. Uh, you can call bio-based carbon fibers a revolution because I think that will be a big step forward and will we see it? A big step in sustainability, I think, Let's call this a revolution because it's a very important, very big step. I think in the process technologies, we will see more evolution. We will uh, apply uh, microwaves for the curing. We will see uh, also bio-based resin materials. We will see a better understanding of the uh, placement technologies by using artificial intelligence, for example. And in Augsburg, we have a got a lot of public money from the federal state of Bavaria. Uh, we call it um, Produktions, KI Produktions uh, Netzwerk, where the University of Augsburg is working together with DLR and Fraunhofer on uh, artificial intelligence in producing carbon fiber technologies. And there we can see revolutions. But it's all the mad question, is it revolution or evolution? <laughs> but very good developments for sure. <laughs> and so I guess just, just to finish it off, you, you're a very busy person. Uh, <laughs> you, you go between uh, Augsburg and Garching and Otterbrunn. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just wondering if you had any advice for, for students who uh, you know, are trying to deal with stressful situations just to get through the exam season. What, what, what did you do when you were a student to, to, to persevere? Uh, <laughs> I think to, to have a good, good balance, I think, between, yeah. between work and, yeah, we call it now work-life balance. Yeah. 
when I was a student, nobody knew this word. <laughs> for me, it was important, important during the weekend. For me personally, for example, uh, glider flying right. is, a, is a topic where, yeah, you can exhaust and uh, yeah, recover energy, but that's all, only part. I think it's uh, important that you are fascinated about what you are doing. And I think aerospace offers this potential and our department at the Technical University offers this potential. I would really like to encourage you to work in the students' groups. Uh, like Aka Fleek, uh, I'm the president of Aka Fleek, and it's very, very exciting to see how the students are developing their own plane. But the same for Aka Model or for Horizon. I think uh, it's important, at the, even the very beginning of, this, of the study, to see why you are learning something. And there's an application for it. It's a, it's a meaning, it's a technology behind, and really to, to be be fascinating about it. So I know there's also stuff uh, which is not so exciting uh, at the beginning of the study. I think it's more and more exciting in the master phase or at the end of the, the bachelor. But if you start uh, working at an institute uh, as a student and also uh, yeah, work in the students group to see the meaning and the application of all the, the things you are working together and to team up with students, not only in the students group, but also to help. It's always an up and down. And one is up, one is down. <laughs> and then probably you can find a good good average and help each other. I think that's 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 some suggestion. great advice. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So mm -hmm. Professor Drexler, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, thank mm -hmm. you for listening and make sure to tune in for the following episodes of uh, On Air Actually mm -hmm. Rocket Science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.